The Diesel Podcast. Digital integration in English as a second or other language. Episode 59, Artificial Intelligence and ESOL. Welcome to Diesel. This is episode 59. We are your hosts. I'm Brent I'm, Warner. Oops, I was going to be Brent Warner. You were? I was going to say I'm Brent Warner. <laughs> That's how my passcodes have been getting out all over the mm. place. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Brent. All right. The, the mystery is solved. How are you, Brent? <laughs> Alive. How are you? Living, living Growing my beard daily. Li- living alive. All right, good. <laughs> living a lie as Brent Warner. Is it still cold for you? Yeah, it's still cold over here, but it didn't snow. It hasn't snowed recently. If it doesn't snow, it means I can go out and run. And as you know, I run to the castle, Kamaki Castle, that's nearby. And yeah, running makes me happy. I get to see foxes and cats and old people feeding cats. <laughs> like I see foxes and cats. It sounds like a like a, a Miyazaki movie or something. I run into the castle. <laughs> it the is. Foxes. That's how I feel. And it's dark and <laughs> creepy. And there's like little little um I don't know if they're called the little mini shrines that are everywhere. Little tiny ones. Mm-hmm. And it's dark and I go at night and the air is fresh and cold and it hits your face and you're like, Ah, I'm alive. Hmm. All right. <laughs> Very zen. Yeah. <laughs> How about you? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, actually, I can. I can, California. I can connect with that a little bit. So I've been I've been going to campus two days a week. Um, to teach, I'm just teaching from campus, just trying to not be at home all the time. And but I've been riding my bike there, so I'm getting. Oh, that's that's yeah. Yeah, getting a little bit of exercise, and it's uh, you know, it takes about an hour to ride my bike to campus from here, and so I get uh, but the but I, I did it yesterday, and it was super super uh. Um, windy no it was foggy out and so oh yeah because so you live near the coast yeah and so like going leaving at like six forty-five in the morning and then like I was just drenched like there was the whole my whole jacket was just completely soaked my beard was soaked my like my my helmet has a little brim on it and like water was mm-hmm. dripping down from that. it wasn't so it wasn't raining <laughs> but it was like just the yeah, collective water of, of like, thick fog. yeah so um, I bet I can find a beard protector in Japan oh um, or not protector. the Japanese don't tend to grow beards but if they did I bet you they'd have one available isn't kind of the purpose of having a beard to be the protector of your face <laughs> your as face. it is <laughs> like in theory so, <laughs> yes so your beard was effective then yeah, it, it was served its purpose it protected my neck <laughs> All right, let's get into it. This is nonsense. Absolute nonsense. All right, what do you got for us? What are we talking about? Artificial intelligence. Artificial in intelligence. Diesel. What is right. artificial intelligence? Let's jump over. All right. What's artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence. Well, no doubt we've heard of it. We are familiar <laughs> with facial recognition. Of course, that's like the, the number one people usually guess. Um, we, If your phone opens up when you show your face, then that's facial recognition. We use it for payments, um, but it's also used in self-driving cars, which of course, that's the other big thing happening. Uh, doctors use it to predict certain things with big data. And then we have, of course, Google Translate and chatbots, which now are everywhere. Whenever you go to a website and you're trying to you know, find answers to something, there's usually a little chat chat bot but artificial intelligence is um a computer or a program trying to learn from its own data i don't know stop <laughs> i'm gonna <laughs> go i'm, I'm gonna let you define me. this as if the listeners like don't have any idea what the idea of artificial intelligence is like i appreciate your <sighs> your effort here to like to the one person who's been living under the rock and suddenly found themselves subscribing to the diesel podcast. <laughs> and they're like hmm, what is this thing called artificial intelligence okay we don't really about? we don't really need to talk about what it is no what we do need to talk about is uh artificial intelligence in our field right so all right so I think right. We, we've talked about you know i mean we've mentioned things like um 
you know, Siri and Alexa and some of those like mm-hmm. digital assistant type of mm-hmm. things, right? So the, those are listening to you and trying to understand and supposedly getting better at understanding you. I don't always agree with that with the Alexa. You know, Alexa does oh, not yeah. listen to me and I get mad at and her. And Siri doesn't get better. <laughs> Siri gets better at knowing, at predicting what I might ask, but doesn't get better at understanding what I'm asking. Even, you know, sometimes I ask, what's the weather? And she'll ask me to unlock first. It's like, I no. Really? And then by then, yes. And then by then I have to ask the question again. So she doesn't keep track of her like two-step commands or three-step commands. She oh. can't do that yet. That's that's pretty seems pretty low level to me i mean i'm not a not a programmer so maybe someone would give me a hard time for saying that but it seems like hey come on (laughs) like you shouldn't one you shouldn't have to unlock it just to ask it but i guess maybe someone could drain your battery if they start just talking to siri with your phone locked maybe is that what we're getting to yes that's interesting i didn't think about that anyways i turned siri off as soon as i get my phone so um (laughs) serious off for me too yeah siri's terrible um (laughs) All right. So what we really do want to talk about, though, is this idea of like using artificial intelligence. How is it going to be used in our field? How is it currently being used? Um, I think we've got a number of questions. And so today, Ishelle, I think our, our conversation is going to be a little bit different because most of the time we um, we bring up some articles and then we kind of talk about the, the research and what's going on. And then we talk and try and share some tools and some practical things in the classroom. Uh, but today, I think we're kind of going in a little bit of a different tack and we're going to be focusing more on, well, we'll talk about some articles and some things that are out there, but I think what we're going to do is then talk about maybe some predictions or what the future might look like potentially um, with uh, some some of the artificial intelligence changes as they start coming into teaching and into um, ESOL and all of those other things. So we're going to talk about um, maybe talk about some questions that come up in our field. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the number one question and it, it seems to come obviously from a place of fear, I would say, is will artificial intelligence replace language teachers? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I I think we'll get into this later in the predictions, mm-hmm. I think. Um, but I'm going to say oh, yes. I, I, oh. I'm going to say I don't think we'll fully replace them. I think they will be another part of it'll be another tool. I don't know. I, I can't see that far ahead. All right. Let's, let's hold that question until, um, the end, because I think there's some conversation around that one. Uh, but some of the other ones we can kind of step for prepping in. So what else uh-huh. we got? Um, in our field, where is artificial intelligence currently being used? Uh, so one of those, this is a good point to get into is like, I think one of the places we see, uh, artificial intelligence being used right now is a lot in Google, right? So we've got Mm -hmm. Google translate, um, we've got the voice recognition software. So if we've talked about this in the past and I talk about it in all my presentations and things is like, um, the Google voice trans, uh, transcriber, right? When you're in Google Mm -hmm. docs and use the voice thing and it writes down what you're saying, um, there's also, um, you know, lot, lots of these programs or apps that are out there that are like trying to help you with your language and kind mm-hmm. of uh, using algorithms and trying to um, respond to you and teach you vocabulary words. A lot of those things are using AI algorithms uh, to get them going. Um, I guess we could be a little bit careful and, and we'll, we'll try and be uh, kind on ourselves because some true computer scientists might be like, well, there's a difference between artificial intelligence and machine learning. And, the, you know, like as the machines are actually teaching mm-hmm. themselves versus it just recognizes what it's programmed to know, we'll kind of say, okay, we get that kind of, but, um, but I think for now we're just kind of trying to think of like the computer's responding to us, right. And the Mm -hmm. computer's is interacting with us in, in certain ways without another person, uh, being involved with that. So, uh, those are a few, uh, shell, any other ones that you're thinking of? Yeah. So I know that we have, um, a few extensions that help students to, uh, paraphrase, um, and that, you know, obviously there is some kind of learning going on. Mm -hmm. If something is able to pick up what you're saying and then giving you different options based on that. Um, 
And so I think there's extensions that do that. I don't, I haven't tested extensively because, you know, I use it mostly for academic writing um, and short snippets of text Mm -hmm. rather than longer snippets of text. And, but there is plenty of um, websites that I think one of them was, was it called Resumer? Yeah. Yeah. We've talked about that. Yeah. I remember you talking Mm -hmm. about that one and that one just kind of, I've never used it, but it, I remembered it, but stuff like that, that um, addresses one component of language, but then imagine if all of them came together. Right. It will translate those transcriber extensions all in one. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think that's where the creativity might start coming is we're starting to see like, how do we blend these different ideas together? Um, And so I think that there's some, some fun stuff to play with. Um, And then we'll also get into like, you know, what are the implications for, for our field, right? What are the implications overall? Um, I think kind of what you're talking about, right? There's going to be error correction stuff. There's going to be things like, um, uh, you know, interactive programs. Uh Yeah. It's going to be cool. Um, but let's talk about a couple of these articles here, Ishel. Um, I'm not sure if Uh there's any ones that that were stood out to you that you want to talk about. I kind of had one or two points from some of them that I thought were interesting. Yeah. Well, first I wanted to point out that as I was searching for information, a lot of the stuff that I kept coming up with, uh, was, you know, material, um, pointing at some kind of aspect of AI, uh, fused into some kind of software and then that research or the studies or whatever it was, a uh, data gathered was by that company who yeah, was, yeah, yeah. you know, so, so it was really hard to find something that was, guess what? Um, it's amazing. And what our, pro- <laughs> what our program does is the best, right? Yeah. So I found, you know, that, that tells me that there's not enough out there and it's quite, obviously quite limited and only people who test that specific thing can give you feedback. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I had a hard time with this, Um, but you found a couple of articles. Yeah. So um, there were a couple out there. uh, One from, um, well, actually a couple on this, uh, this, what you're speaking about, there's this uh, company called Glossica, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, And I haven't, I haven't played with this yet, but, um, but it, you know, the way they kind of describe it in one of the articles is they say like, un- and this is a quote from an article, it says, unlike traditional approaches for which utilize uh, lessons and weekly plans, Glossica attempts to tailor learning material to your specific level and needs. Users select the topics that are most important for them and work at a comfortable pace on their desktops or smartphones. And so that kind of seems like a smart way, you know, it's kind of, it's also similar maybe to Duolingo, but I think one of the arguments mm-hmm. that they're making in here is that a lot of these language learning things um, will start you off with language that you don't need for your practical work life, for example. Like a lot of people are studying a language because, hey, I have to do some business, right? I have to go fly overseas. Mm -hmm. I have to go to this conference. I have to communicate with people. Um, In that case, you know, uh, do I need to know how to say, uh, you know, postage stamp or, um, you know, like giraffe or, you know, whatever, <laughs> like there's some of these mm-hmm. things that are not really going to be relevant. And so I think they're trying to get into maybe a little bit more and then, and then try to get you uh, use the AI to customize towards what your actual outcome learning goals are, which seems like a pretty smart idea, right? Like this is what we do in a lot of like specialized English classes, right? It's like the students are like, well, I kind of have a little bit of a base. I don't really want to just learn all general English anymore. Now I need to kind of uh, get it specified towards my needs. Right. And I think that you know, points me to the fact, a problem I keep running into here in Japan, where I have studied Japanese, enough basic Japanese to do superficial daily kind of things. Mm-hmm. But then I, I'm i missing the piece that allows me to form a, a, a deeper connection with someone that give, that shows my personality. And I keep finding apps that will help me with Japanese, but they're mostly helping me with basic vocabulary sets or very basic um Japanese structure, which is what I already have, or, and then it jumps into like people who want to be, who are living here, who need to be fluent, like fluent in all the areas. And so there's a gap between the beginner and 
and someone who might be more proficient. So I ended up having to reach to an actual human tutor (laughs) and someone who was giving classes. And I just gave him a rundown of like, here's what I'm looking for. And that's what I would want. And something that, you know, an AI offers that as opposed to like Duolingo where, you know, their, their approach is teaching you certain things as they would to a child, Mm -hmm. you know, when they're first learning and acquiring language their own native language or the vocabulary um but something where it's like hey i I need english for the workplace and a little bit of you know i need to be able to build relationships with people that's the kind of uh specialized component that i think ai might be able to do yeah I agree. Um, so another one that I thought was interesting was this Forbes article. Um, Michelle, did you look at this one? The language lessons from artificial intelligence. It came out last year. Um, and and oh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, this one started talking about this company called uh, Hour One. And pre-show, I showed you a little video of this. Mm-hmm. Um, this is pretty amazing. <laughs> so mm-hmm. so it got into this whole thing where like basically what they're doing is they're scanning an actor's face or an actress's face right and they're and then they're they have all these different voices and so what they do is they put in a script and then this voice actually this voice and face can be made into a video in order to talk directly to people with just like the content that already exists right and so you might start by going well hold on a second if you're going to type out all this material then why why wouldn't you just record it for yourself so the idea behind this, and it, if you, we'll put the link in the show notes, it's really mm-hmm. worth going and taking a look at yeah, how they've kind of cool. set it up. It's kind of creepy and it's kind of cool, but like, yeah. But um, but basically, what would happen is, let's say that someone liked me as their teacher, right? They're like, I want Brent as my teacher, and. I don't have time to be everyone's teacher, right? So what they might do is they might scan my face and they might kind of put <laughs> scan my voice in there and then they put in all of this general material, but I'm the person or which are, you know, this artificial intelligence version of me is out there talking and explaining all of these things when all of these scripts maybe could be used for different purposes, but the script, the language itself could just be collected and then put together right in there and so you could actually have this interaction with a person that you like and I'm sorry I guess I'm making the the (laughs) assumption that people like me sorry Um, but but you could kind of do that right and so again this is step one where you're really kind of talking low-level stuff but if you start getting into this I actually really see a future where there's going to be some teachers taking advantage of this and then having a huge database uh, because you basically start copying and pasting text right into this thing and it just you click a button and it's like boom here you are right and here here's you or here's this artificial intelligence thing going through and and talking through the script but also catching intonation hopefully uh, i'm not totally sure how how great it is at all of those things but as it will continue to improve then you're going to have this fully customizable thing and michelle we were talking about pre-show with the uh Remember the GPSs? <laughs> the G- mm-hmm. the custom- you, can cha- you can change the voice of your GPS to like Buzz Lightyear from yeah. <laughs> from Toy Story yeah, or yeah, yeah. So you know, I, James Bond. Exactly. And so can you imagine like people are just going to go, oh, okay, I want this celebrity to be my English teacher now and I'm going to take a lesson and they're going to kind of just talk to me. And it might not be totally interactive at this point. I do think down the line, I think there'll be like a, a real ability for response and things, but it's pretty interesting, right? You know, uh, as you're speaking about this, and I don't know why the thought didn't cross my mind, but you're, we're talking about collecting uh, the speaking samples from a teacher and their whatever um, methods they use to teach or explain something that's already written and you're just inputting it in there. This is no different than... Um, music programmers who use different tones in someone's voice, collect them and then play them and make up an entire song with a 3D avatar. And then you've got Hatsune Miku, who has like a following of millions of people all over the world. And she's not real. (laughs) I was thinking of 
meow, 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 meow. <laughs> Like where, what, they, where meow, they program meow, in all the, the meows at oh, different Oh, and you can translate the, what they're... <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's just music, but there's, I don't think the cats are actually talking. Maybe they are. No, but I mean, um, but yeah, I mean, we're, if we're talking about English teaching, you, you've got to be able to hear the person's intonation and yeah, it's been done with music. Mm-hmm. So then not, but now you've got a face that exists and you can have Brent teach you uh recipes in english <laughs> for the low price of 9.99 i'll teach you a recipe in english uh what recipe am I read me to a teach? bedtime story oh, it doesn't matter what I'm, i don't have to prepare because it's all no, just done yeah it's okay, all you know it's funny i'm like oh my gosh i have to prepare a recipe lesson <laughs> like, nope. the whole point is that you're not preparing anything yeah okay so pretty pretty amazing um, creepy cool yeah but definitely i i hope that people go and check out the show notes and get the link to that because it's worth watching just the intro video and kind of getting a sense of where that that might go so i picked out a quote from one of the articles uh it's a pick 2020 article called intelligent information processing for language education the use of artificial intelligence in language learning apps and of course we were talking about duolingo um and you know recently duolingo became an official English tester or, you know, like some, um, the equivalent of a TOEFL. Really? And you get a certificate. Yeah. You get a certificate. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's been now two years or so. No, that's not very recent. Mm -hmm. Two years, but that's COVID time. So like, so like 20 seconds, right. That's what you really mean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But anyway, um, so here's a quote, because we talk about where we were finding AI and it tends to be in language learning apps. Um, the changes in pedagogy are underway regarding new approaches of both the educators who are responsible also for the creation of the courses, but also for the students who have radically different needs and approaches to retrieving knowledge and information. And this is a line that, that, um, that stood out to me. The current young generation of the students who were born around the year 2000 Zillennials, millennials, cusp millennials have radically different tools to acquire competencies and skills. They also use different tools for evaluation of the information they have acquired online. These aspects must be taken into consideration as as well, so as not to lose competitiveness and global sustainability. So it's it's a warning. It's the warning that we've always, you know, in us in ed tech, we, we tell people, Hey, this is coming. We need to get with the times. The longer you leave the gap, you know, the more it widens. And then you've got a pandemic sort of shoving you through it. And so I think to not talk about AI or artificial intelligence is we're kind of, maybe we're not so sure about it. We're sometimes fearful of it, but it is there with Mm -hmm. our, uh, you know, self-driving cars and everything else. It's there. So um, I just thought it was important to to highlight that this is why we're talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, as we kind of wrap up some of these articles and research, uh, I do want to point out uh, this. If you start looking up like English language learning and artificial intelligence, like the name is going to show up over and over and over again, which is uh, Marina Dodiv. Uh, uh, Dodigovic, which is she, she's a Croatian, one of my one of my bloodline. Um, it's not my bloodline, but my my people from <laughs> from generations past somewhere. Um, so, anyways, uh, she has written lots of articles from a long time ago. So, like you know, way before like the current conversation. I think the article that I'm t- I'm pulling right here is from two thousand seven or to eight or maybe i don't know i can't remember but um but she she's been doing all sorts of different articles on different parts of using ai for learning and she would analyze tools that other companies had made and see how it works with the students um but one of the things the quote that i i thought was interesting from this one called um speech recognition technology in language testing does taking the test in an english-speaking environment matter um which you know, by itself, the whole article was interesting, but just getting into part of this, uh, this artificial intelligence part, I thought it was interesting that she said, an important pedagogical question is also when to correct an error. Given the nature of a question, it seems very important to decide whether an erroneous utterance contains a genuine error, right? And so I think one of the things we're going to be dealing with is like, 
hey, students say that they want to get corrected, but as teachers, we know that we cannot correct every mistake, right? And so I think we'll definitely see some major missteps with some companies trying to correct every time Mm -hmm. a student makes an error. So let's just say, let's imagine this kind of beautiful future where it's like, I just talk to the computer and the computer talks back to me, but the computer will also stop me if it's, if it recognizes that I'm making an error. Right. And so if I say, um, you know, something like, um, uh, yesterday I, yesterday I go to the bank, right. And it's like, okay, that is definitely an error and it's wrong (laughs) and it should be fixed. But if that's a, you know, if that is a one-time error from that person and they're just kind of moving through a sentence, trying to get more important information across, then is, are they going to get frustrated when the computer stops them and says, hold on, you said go and it should have been went, right? Or something like that. And so we're we're going to definitely see, because even as humans, we deal with this, right? We're like, uh, should I be fixing this? Should I be overcorrecting? Where is, where is the right balance that actually helps them and makes them feel motivated to learn, but doesn't dissuade them from their own abilities, right? And I see um, some interesting, we are going to see a lot of kind of, uh, dealing with that as an issue for trying to have interactive language learning, I think, and, and error correction inside of AI. So imagine Brent that, so I'm thinking, so how, if there were this magical tool already there, mm-hmm. how it would be correcting us as quote unquote native speakers. Oh my God, terrible. <laughs> have you seen then- the transcripts that like, <laughs> so we get these AI transcripts for the show and I have to spend hours going back and fixing uh, some, oh, I don't, I don't get all of everything. It but. does not recognize my name after how many times? No, you're not a person. F- 59 it's not learning, shows. It's definitely not learning your name. <laughs> so. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, what, It always wants to change me to what, Michelle, oh, which right. is what people always wanted to call me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. You are you are Michelle in the in there, or sometimes you are he shall, uh, <laughs> like X I. No, he shall like he shall go to the <laughs> the royal throne. I guess that's I all right. Know. I am gender fluid, and that is totally okay. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, you're right though. Like this is it, it's it's very interesting to kind of see this and like go, okay, well, hold on a second. Where is it going to, where is this going to land? Well, here's what would be cool because I tend to run into this issue with some of my students uh, who have studied, you know, they know every idiom in the book, but unfortunately the idioms are old now. And yes, I know the idiom I've heard it, but only older people use it. So it doesn't seem to fit their, the student's personality. Mm -hmm. So now this, tool would have to take the current data in the last, I don't know, I wouldn't say like 10 years, because I don't know how, how how fast language is changing, especially with um, social media. Faster yeah. So faster, you would want to yeah. take, yeah, you'd want to take like a period of 10 years, analyze all that language, you speak something and now it tells you, okay, are you speaking casually? Are you speaking formally? Uh, is it, do you want it in the current slang version or you want, do you want it in slang from the Midwest or do you want British yeah, whatever that's super because cool. that would be cool so it's like that recognizing would be so your cool. register and and right. putting, putting all of that into it and giving your responses in those ways yeah for sure mm-hmm. and that's actually super useful because like let's say for example and i think there are some things that do this like let's say you're writing an email and like the tone of your email is not appropriate mm-hmm. for like writing mm-hmm. to your teacher or for um you know or like trying to get a job or something and so Back when I lived in Japan, I had this this colleague who, who you know whose job it was to um, to send us messages and kind of you know keep us on top of our work and hey send us this information and and she would always use command forms and she would always be like no. you will send the paper to me by tomorrow and it's like whoa uh, yeah <laughs> I recently yep I recently had this uh, someone come to me to double check their translation of a formal ceremony schedule. Mm -hmm. And the first event or the first item on the schedule was everybody rise (laughs) for, you know, to greet this, you know, VIP person. Uh But the English version was um, all men and women will stand up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it just sounded like, (laughs) all righty then. (laughs) 
<laughs> so and then it would shift to so but again you're translating in you know honorific language mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. from Spanish uh, Spanish I mean I'm sorry I'm getting all my languages confused but um English doesn't have an honorific form right I mean it has formal language for a ceremony but you don't necessarily have all of the different you know all the different levels that Japanese oh, or no, another not, language might and so yeah not you would have to know form. that yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and then and then it's like okay, so how does it how does it recognize or how are we supposed to translate that into a way that still maintains, you know, politeness and the tone of it and mm-hmm. all of those types of things. So it's, uh, I mean, and that would be useful for us too because as teachers, because sometimes we, you know, I catch myself and I'm more careful with this now where I don't want to generalize. That's how people speak in this way because students will ask me, how do they say this in such state, and I'll say, I don't know. I've heard this and when I hear it, I tend to think of it's from the South. Mm -hmm. So we would have to check. I don't want to generalize like all people from the South speak this way or all because I, someone may have moved around. So like, yeah. Kiss my grits. (laughs) Is that what your students are (laughs) asking They always say, you guys, you guys say y'all in Texas, only in Texas. But the truth is I used to say y'all in California. Y'all is showing up big time in California. So we actually had the conversation. We were at a restaurant the other day and mm-hmm. like the two different, uh, one waiter, one waitress came up and, and just straight up used it very naturally y'all, and like everything yeah. else. So it, it's, it's, uh, y'all is making a, 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 an invasion all the way across the nation. Are Texans moving out of Texas? Is it's, it flipping uh, the script? I'm serious. I, yeah. And I think that's also interesting because it might be also part of the, um, the gender and the pronoun conversations with. Younger, Absolutely. Younger oh yeah. So. so again, that's a whole other, you know, and when I talk about these movements or these changes in language and how we're adjusting to what reflects our society here, when I talk about it with like, say my Japanese teachers, they're not there yet in terms of social movement mm-hmm. and uh, they're not there yet. So for them to hear that, yeah, we now can add our pronouns and it's important to think about how you're going to, what, what you're going to choose for yourself. They are not there yet. So Mm -hmm. for them, it's a brand new thing, but it does help them to stop and think like this is where we might be going in a few years as well. Um, Um, There's a lot of interesting stuff, but let's take a quick little break. All right. So, uh, it is February, the month of love and all sorts of other good things. Um, and so for us, I think this time around, we're just asking a favor uh, to sh- spread the love a little bit. Um, spread, and the love. spread the love. Uh, is that a, are we making that song up right now or is that a, is that a real one? Well, I, I'm sure it's, it's not a Neil Young song. Oh, Heart of Gold. Good old Neil Young. All right. Um, so uh, if you uh, if you if you've been enjoying the show, like I think what we're going to ask this time is just share an episode with a teacher that you know. Um, if you can share it out and say like, "Hey, this is cool or useful or valuable," um, whatever episode you like, or if it's this one and you're on your podcatcher and you can tweet it out or whatever, um, it would mean a lot to us just to kind of share out a little bit. Say, "Hey, this show is useful, valuable, and." Um, that is our uh, our Valentine's ask. Is can you our Valentine's ask? <laughs> are we allowed to ask for Valentine's qu- thing like things specifically? I don't know if that's Diesel like... Crew. Be our Valentine. Oh yeah, we could. Oh, I should. We should have come up with some clever like uh, diesel puns around Valentine's. Um, we'll work on it. We'll we'll put out some <laughs> Valentine's Day cards and. S- <laughs> <laughs> see what happens but if you're willing if you like the show if you could share it out uh just one person would be awesome thanks so much yeah all right let's talk about predictions mm-hmm. i think this part is fun yeah. uh because there's no limit <laughs> what do you got brent um so i guess we're trying to think about like different ways that things that might happen with the future mm-hmm. of artificial intelligence and with education and and of course our field um for language learners so i'm going to go 
with um, a lot more personalized content. And I think we're starting to see mm -hmm. some of this coming in already, um, even mm -hmm. with like Duolingo and the the, uh, the service that we talked about before, where we might be able to see things where it's going to start sending learners information based on their direct interest and also their language level, right? And so we're going to be able to see things where it's like, oh, you know, if you like you like basketball and you're kind of intermediate then they might start just sending you uh you know an article that you could read like a real legitimate article i think this is this is some of the things we're going to start seeing is like they're going to go out there and find a, an actual real article that you could handle and then it's going to send it to you and say hey this might be of interest to you right and all the ai would be doing would be analyzing the language of the mm -hmm. article so maybe it's something like usa today where it's like a little bit easier read, right? So it's not going to be The Economist. It's not going to be the New, New York Times or anything like that. But maybe it's USA Today. And since it knows that you like um, basketball, it's going to send you an article on Steph Curry or something like that. And I could see, like, that's just one level of it. But I can really see um, people getting, like, right in their inbox or right on their apps or whatever it is, just super personalized content, things that you know that you're going to like because the algorithms are getting, you know, some Sometimes we complain about it, but like, I think the times we don't complain about those algorithms that are chasing us are the times when they're actually being successful, which is more of the time. Uh -huh. And so we're like, oh, what is this garbage algorithm? It doesn't know anything. But really, the most of the time we're like, oh, yeah, I'm actually kind of interested in this thing. Right. And so I think we'll start to see. Um, as it comes into like language learning fields that maybe maybe they can start to customize that material and send us authentic materials that will be um, right. to our interest and our right learning. that would that would solve the issue of having to find an article on true crime because I've got students who love true crime and then an article on comedy or mm -hmm. you know a, 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 that type of humor uh, in the writing style that would really um, cut down on having to you know, gather all that material because you've got to, like you said, we've got to personalize the content. And if it's, you know, if it's English content and the student is already showing an interest for that topic or that genre, um, then you would have, you know, you'd have a cache at your fingertips of all of that. Yeah. Well, and also um, I'm going to point out, I mean, I'm saying articles, but that also means podcasts and yeah, YouTube I'm videos and films. TV shows, mm -hmm. yeah, films, all everything, of, any type of media content any digital content that these things can go out there and scan they can spend send their bots and their web crawlers all across and just grab <laughs> that information <laughs> web crawlers like <laughs> web crawlers remember web crawlers um, yes. so, <laughs> so um so yeah so it could bring that all back right and so I, i'm like I'm saying articles, but really anything. And could you imagine how robust your your content and your database of things that you just might be uh, interested in? Yeah. And that's, you know, it takes so much time for a teacher to find oh that God, information forever. and then find it at the level. Uh, you know, I've got a student who likes uh, animals. So I found the documentary, but now I really want an article about, you know, mm -hmm. that layers on top of that. And I also want a podcast because I want him listening and then I want conversation questions. And so it, I've got to pull all of this stuff. It takes time. And that's just one student. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I think, I think my prediction is, and I know we talked about this um, in the medical field, there's already, you know, big data is being pulled to analyze uh, potential medical treatments um, through AI. And I, I feel that programs like Google Translate or ELSA, they already have data that mm -hmm. they've collected. They've got, especially if you're translating with the, using that voice function, right, right. Um, which I've actually used here in, in Japan, and it's not bad. It's actually pretty good. Uh, but more availability of a, a program, um, mm -hmm that includes more, more than just the translation part, uh, just expansion of what we already have in terms of tools. So I, I just feel that it ultimately it's going to be Google, some Google product that is going to purchase other things like Elsa, for example, I know we've talked about Elsa before mm -hmm. and integrated in there. And I, and I think it's going to be something that's free, but we're going to be trading off the fact that in order for this to have the data it's got to gather it from human sources and that's going to be us and that's going to be you know this whole privacy thing or but i i mean i i'm glad that google translate is at the stage it is now because 10 years ago 
it wasn't. And it's thanks to all of the people who have allowed <laughs> to to have their voice <laughs> recorded or their, you know, their key input um, cataloged. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So I think another one here, um, kind of, you know, in connection and building on top of all of these things, I think there's going to be automated I plus one content. So like if you're going to mm-hmm. get that you know, that comprehensible input and you're going to be starting to, to add in like just a little bit harder than what you're used to or a little bit more advanced than what you're comfortable with. Right. And so I think that it doesn't. So again, let's say we go back to like what I was talking about with personalized content or you kind of saying like, Hey, we're going to be pulling in this big data is that then it, it will start actually summarizing or paraphrasing or expanding based on a little bit more than what it knows that you already know, right? And so it, this like is based, one level up. Yeah, so it's like tiered like readers. So like we've got one. Newzella, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. Newzella, they have people that are going in there and doing all of this work. Mm-hmm. I think AI is going to do this automatically and it's going to be based on anything that you are interested in as well, right? So it's going to be, it doesn't matter if it's something that, oh, Newzella has already gone in and figured this out. It's like, no, I want to go into, um, I want to go right into Reddit and I want to read this Reddit thread that I'm looking at and I want to push a button and it's going to change the language in there and make it just Mm. a little harder for me so like I can read it I can understand it but it's also going to give me a couple of challenges right there like built into the browser for example and let me kind of interact with it and say like I do understand what this is saying or I don't understand what this is saying and so it'd take you know, if we're going with the Reddit example, hundreds of people's posts, and in a matter of a split second, it's going to readjust that language. So it's still saying the same thing, but slightly adjusted to be able to be a little bit, uh, one, maybe easier for you to understand, but two, not so hard and not so slangy that you can't follow along with what it's getting at. So I think that we're going to see some, some area, I don't know if it'll look exactly like that, but there's definitely the potential for that. Can this potential tool examine memes and then sure. translate them into what they're actually saying? Because then my mom would understand them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, well, I mean, you know, ultimately, like that's, we're talking about it being able to do anything that a human brain can yeah. do, right? So it's like, yeah. so, but it's, that's an interesting one because I, I've listened to podcasts in the past where they, mm-hmm you know, like on, um, on reply all back in the day, they used Mm -hmm. to do like, what does this meme mean? Right. And then they would have to get into like full context and like Mm -hmm. explain it for 30 minutes, which, you know, that'll be a much higher level, but I I could potentially see like, here's the background on this and here's the things you need to know. And I mean, ultimately it's etymology kind Mm -hmm. of, you know, because that's what we do with words. Now we, we find the etymology and we see how they're related and we find, but it's just etymology of, you know, 21st century <laughs> language, I guess. Ed- edemimology. <laughs> Edem- edemimology. That's it. <laughs> we need to. We need to take that word now. <laughs> yeah. Put it, uh, um, I'm gonna. I'm gonna NFT that word and make some real. Yeah. Money NFT. On it. <laughs> <laughs> That's wow. How NFTs okay. Work, right? <laughs> yes. We just copyright so. anything that we imagine, and it's ours. Except someone that out there will buy it. it. <laughs> I bet there's someone out there that will buy it. So with all of this, um, all of this progress, I think that there will be more companies using this AI component as the selling point for their programs, which I always think, you know, you've got to be really careful uh, when companies are trying to get you to use their software or their tool, whatever it is, and using the one thing uh, you know, to as their selling point and trying to get you to pay more or pay into a subscription. And the reality is that a lot of this stuff may be in an earlier stages of development. Mm-hmm. And um, I can see where this would be a big sell in, in the test prep world because test prep is not going away. And, you know, everyone wants to pass the TOEFL and the TOEIC and the IELTS mm-hmm. and all of those other tests. And, um, not everybody can go to tutors or cram schools or et cetera. And so I think that that might be um, a place where we're going to see it maybe spread more widely. But I also feel that we should probably um, proceed with caution because AI at this point and with programs that pitch it as their 
their selling point. I don't, it's not a fix all. And we've got to just be cautious about it, I suppose. Oh, well, a hundred percent. This, this is, we are going <laughs> to see this ridiculous waste of energy because here's what's going to happen. Students are going to get, click a button to get AI to produce an essay for them. And then teachers are going to press a button to get AI to respond to that essay. And then <laughs> students are going to click a button to get the responses updated and, and responded to. And then the teachers are going <laughs> to click a button to get, recognize those changes in the response and get a grade. And nobody would will have done anything and nobody will have learned anything. I, I, I like, <laughs> I, I am kind of not joking here. So like, let's, let's keep an eye out for that. I mean, it's very, yeah. it's kind of like dark dystopian, but like, but I really do see that as like another thing that we'll have to be careful of if we don't actually have the human eyes on things and like, really right. say like and hey, just... where is, where is the, the human element to this? <laughs> right. And moving on to creepier. <laughs> so creepier, <laughs> creepier. Uh, so we did kind of talk about this, the deep faking world, audio and video um, for faces, right? So we mentioned that before, like I could scan my face and you could have me talking. I don't know if you ever saw this, Michelle, but there was um, uh, uh, Jordan Peele was like at an Adobe um, event of some sort. And they basically brought him on stage and they're interviewing him and talking to him. And then they bring that, this other guy with a computer and he starts typing stuff. And it's like, he like Jordan Peele's <laughs> voice saying things that he has never said before, right? And then like you see Jordan Peele's face. This is a couple of years ago, but he's like, he's like, what the heck is going on? <laughs> he was like totally freaked out by it, and he's like, this is this is like sounds super real. Like it caught all the intonations. He could chop out like individual words or add in words right in the middle of what he was talking about. Um, so we definitely will see some room for deep faking. Um, but then like interaction with those deep fakes. So like, hey. I don't have a friend and I sorry, don't, don't isolate that language either. Um, <laughs> where you're like, uh, we're like, I don't have a friend, but hey, I, I want to talk- get you back for posting on the time that I was puking during the show. Oh, that was, well, I mean, we were both kind anyway. of, yeah. So, um, so, I mean, this is straight up Ray Bradbury, Fahrenheit 451. <laughs> like I'm talking about like you're interacting with a wall, right? You put something up, you want to talk to it. It's going to respond to you, but it's maybe it's someone that you want to be your friend or you imagine. I think pe people might actually go straight up crazy with this. Like thinking, BTS. Yeah, I want BTS to teach me a language. Oh my God. You're going to imagine that you know BTS, then you're going to go become a crazy stalker. <laughs> 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 like there is a real, there, you know, like I, I, I don't want to be a chicken little, but there are also so other <laughs> other problematic areas potentially yeah. here so all right well um so <laughs> what else do we got i just think this is a whole new version of what we we i, I don't even think we can fully imagine how language teaching and language learning is going to be with something like this i mm -hmm. think um when we fear that our jobs are going to be you know destroyed by ai or taken over by ai i actually think that it will just be a new version and of course we always fear that we're not going to be able to do what what keeps us um what gives us a paycheck right. <laughs> but i just think it's going to be a new form in the same way that people feared comic books and video games and television and the radio and texting and cell phones and fingerprint scanners and iris scanners and all that i mean cnn just had a segment on a flying car already being approved and coming to the commercial market next year, next year. Yeah. So I am a little bit more on the other side of this. Um, mm -hmm. I, <laughs> you, you've heard me say this. I don't say this to too many yep. people because mm -hmm. they get mad at me about it, but yep. I think it's mm -hmm. the end of ESL. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I think as a as a field as a, you know like for people that need to study it like academic esl and those types of things i think we're we're coming to the end um mm -hmm. people who want to study languages for their own joy and for their own benefit those people will still exist there will be places to you know language learning will still happen but i think that a lot of this stuff is going to get eliminated and reduced um and so i don't think it's going to be as big however i do have one thing that that is kind of a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel which is um, even, you know, some people really want to learn and understand the value of truly learning a language because 
the immediate response back and forth is something different, right? Even if you have like the best translator in the world and you're working at, you know, the UN and that person's standing right next to you and they're doing live translation, that pause and that gap is a distraction to your communication, right? While you're waiting for that person to translate and translate back and all of those types of things. So I do see a place where people are going to go. It doesn't matter because even if I'm speaking and something is translating directly through a micro chip in my throat and it's actually speaking out as I'm speaking, it's still going to be paused and not quite as fast because it has to, because the way that languages themselves work, right? Like the, the structure of the, the grammatical structure of English has to be processed into, into the new language. And it can't come out at the exact second of the word that I'm saying, because maybe their subject goes at the end of the sentence or maybe, you know, whatever it is. And so like my punchline couldn't come out or even a trans translation of a joke at the highest levels, right? That couldn't come out immediately. So I do think ESL as a field as we know it is going to die. Um, and <laughs> I know people are going to go, what? Uh, but I really, I, I not now, not today, tomorrow, but like <laughs> soon and for the rest of your so, life. So does that mean that, <laughs> I mean, but English, English as a global language won't die because I mean, Correct. Even if you could translate and use another trans, you know, a, a beautiful translation tool or device, as you might see in the sci-fi yes. films, um, there are still ways that you cannot express yourself in a language because of the history of the language. So, for example, why hasn't Chinese Mandarin become the global language, even though we know that's where we need to be going, et cetera. And that's because, you know, I was listening to this, of course, a podcast on NPR about how um the ideas of freedom and freedom of speech being so ingrained in the english language mm -hmm. you can express freely there's again not that um hierarchy of politeness according to who you're talking to so if i'm talking to the president i'm gonna say i'm sorry if i'm talking to my dog that i just stepped on i'm gonna say i'm right, sorry right, if right. i'm talking to so so in other languages you don't have that and so it might limit and it might be associated with certain aspects of communism or you know mm -hmm. ours yeah. is democracy and so yeah and religi I think that, religious yeah. beliefs too religious so if you have like arabic well. speakers mm -hmm. where there's like language of god tied directly mm -hmm. into where the language is spoken for sure there's all or sorts spanish mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah so english itself is not going away <laughs> yeah no sorry that, yeah i'm not saying english mm -hmm. is going away i'm not mm -hmm. saying english is a global language is going right. away i'm saying English is a second language as a mm -hmm. field. <laughs> what I do hope this software or AI component or whatever, wherever it ends up being playing a role is that it also helps us monolingual, so I'm bilingual, but people who are monolinguals learn another language. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true too. <laughs> because and, well, we might would... have more time for it too, right? Yeah. To, like, to experience the joy of learning another language because it is a true joy, right? Like understanding and coming and being able to communicate in those ways and just doing it for yourself. I, I totally agree with that for sure. So um, so I'm not going to let let my, uh, let my the uh, story end on a negative funeral note. There is <laughs> true joy. <laughs> Joy of joys with language learning. Joy of joys. <laughs> All right, it is time for our fun finds. And this time I have something that has been helping me. I'm a runner, uh, a serious runner, which is probably why I injured my knee, not <laughs> stretching properly or warming down properly. And uh, it locked up my knees. And one of the ways that... Um, one thing that has helped me to recover my uh, muscle healing is an EMS sheet, and that's electrical muscle stimulation. Mm -hmm. um, you do find them on Amazon, but you find them for people's abs, like to define their abs. But this is just a sheet you put on the ground. You spray it with water that's, that conducts electricity. You put your feet on it, and then you set different frequencies. And it actually exercises your – it stimulates the muscles that may not be healing. And um, – of course, it's an item I found in Japan. I didn't find an EMS sheet on the American Amazon, so I'm not sure if we have something. I'm sure it exists somewhere by a different company, but this one is by Atex, and it's only about what forty eight dollars, which is pretty affordable. And if you you know for if you're you know sitting down all day, that helps you know helps stimulate muscles and um, yeah. So EMS sheet. Nice. 
Okay, so mine is a video that showed up online, and it has just <laughs> made me so happy. Have you seen this, the slippery ice guy, Shell? No. Okay, we're going to watch it together right now. So it is so good. So people who oh are listening, God, this is dude, a I'm purely visual so thing. But this guy walks out of his car, and he gets onto some ice. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, gets on an ice patch. <laughs> and he just. <laughs> oh, you're gonna have to see this. He keeps. <laughs> <laughs> It goes on and on and on and he's like he's like trying to balance himself and he's slipping and he's sliding and he's like gets into like a running mode for a second and oh, it's oh, just oh. it is so is, joyous. It is Is just, that a TikTok video? Well, it's on you're Twitter. Showing me. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yes, it's clearly a TikTok. A TikTok has a, definitely put their their push out, but yeah, it's uh it is a great video. We'll put it up on the show notes if you just I just keep watching it over and over again and just <laughs> like it's just putting me into such a good mood cuz it's silly. The guy's not doesn't get hurt like he's just sl- slipping and sliding all over this ice like a tiny little ice patch right in front of him and it's like a it's like the old like Laurel and Hardy like sl- Slipping on a banana, like type of, you know, <laughs> yes. dumb vaudeville comedy, but it is, it is just so funny. So, um, so I have slippery ice guy, slippery I guess. Ice guy. Yeah. That's, that's my fun find. Well, thank you so much for listening to the show. We do ask that you share the show this month. Um, if you leave us a review on Apple podcasts, they do help spread the word and if you're giving us a shout out any other way just tag us we are on all the platforms on social media of course you can support us through our patreon or with buy us a coffee um we are grateful for anyone who is willing to do that Um, but like we said for february we are just asking share the show that'd be uh, a great uh, gift for us so um, if you want to find the show notes, you can find them uh, for this show and for other episodes at diesel.org slash five nine, the number 59. And of course, you can listen to us at Voice Ed Canada. You can find us on Twitter. The show is at Diesel Pod. And I should also point out we're also on Instagram. <laughs> I never say that, but we are. <laughs> we do we do post on Instagram. So if you just want to kind of know when a new episode comes up, um, you can put it also at Diesel Pod on Instagram. And I am at Brent G. Warner. And I'm Michelle at Ixy underscore Pixie. That's I-X-Y underscore P-I-X-Y. And finish, thank you as Kitos, Kitos for tuning in to the Diesel Podcast. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Happy Valentine's. Mm-hmm.